I can only tell you one thing, looking over 40 years, and that will be the lessons we learned very early on from normalization relations, and before then, the initial U.S.-China rapprochement in the Shanghai communique. If we can manage the relationship with minimal input from public opinion and nationalism, and focus on security, national interests, and we are pragmatic in developing diplomacy, no matter how difficult the domestic environments are, we should be able to manage this change and avoid unnecessary conflict. Well, at one level, it was a common interest against Soviet expansionism and giving the pressing urgency to respond to Soviet foreign policy, the United States and China had to find a way to put on the shelf their bilateral conflicts. But then at the level of diplomacy, we had leaders in both countries that were pragmatic and did not allow ideology or nationalism or domestic politics to get in the way of trying to solve important problems. So Richard Nixon had a career as an anti-communist but he could be a pragmatic security person. And of course, Chairman Mao was persuaded that the America was an imperialist country and the Soviet Union was a revisionist country. But in matters of international security, he too could be a pragmatist. And he could make compromises to advance Chinese security. So it was pragmatism that allowed us to find a common way, a common road to cooperating against the Soviet Union. In the US-China context of the 80s and 90s, we learned that both sides were able to evaluate the necessity for compromise and negotiation on the basis of their own interests, and it was an interest internationally and an interest in bilateral stability. Both countries need to find a pragmatic approach that reflects the new realities of power in the same way that Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai and Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger understood the realities of power in the 70s and 80s and made compromises on that basis. And today, as power relations are changing in economics and security, once again, pragmatism is required to evaluate the implications for security and economic benefit for mutual compromise. Chairman Mao once said that nuclear weapons were paper tigers, but Chairman Mao wanted nuclear weapons. He understood that nuclear weapons will contribute to Chinese security. Since the third plenum of the 11th Central Committee in December 1978, China began modernization. And one of the principal objectives of Chinese modernization was to make China more secure. Now China was patient, and this was the wisdom of peaceful rise. The first Chinese business is to make the economy strong and to advance its technology. Don't waste money on defense when you would only be buying old weapons that were not very effective. And so for 30 years, China built its economy. GDP rose quickly, foreign investment technology rose quickly. And in about 2012, 13, China said, we now have really good technology, and we now know how to build really good ships and aircraft. And China began to spend more money on its Navy and its Air Force. And this, I think, was completely understandable. Because after all, the Americans exercised maritime hegemony all around China. And in a country with better technology and more money from a stronger economy, it was inevitable that China would want to develop its military capabilities. This is what rising powers do. And in so doing, I think it was inevitable that China would want to reduce American influence in countries on China's maritime periphery. Now, those countries happen to be American allies. Now, some people may call this belligerent or aggressive. I think it's the expected behavior of a rising power. I think China is doing what I would think any Chinese leadership would do. So just as it's natural for China to want more security, the United States, it is natural, wants to maintain its security. So I like to think of the U.S.-China relationship not as America responding to a aggressive or belligerent China, but there is a U.S.-China conflict of interest. And conflicts of interest are normal in the world. All countries have conflicts of interest. And the challenge is how you respond to it. 
One way to understand the great power relationship is now we are in a period where China can say no. There are many books back in the 90s and 2000s, China can say no, China should say no. Now China can say no. And China is the country that can say no to America more than any other country. And America, of course, can say no to China. And when the two great powers say no to each other, well, that makes for a difficult relationship, more conflict, more tension, harder to resolve things, as each country believes it can defend its own national interests with less compromise. And for Americans to expect China to respond and compromise with American pressure, as in the past, would be a mistake, because this is a new China. Power transitions don't cause war. They cause greater tension. They may cause crises. But war is not automatic. War is not determined by a single issue, power transitions. And what we want our leaders to be are cautious, moderate, pragmatic, so that they can resist the pressures of nationalism and public opinion, so they can maintain control over their military leaders. So should there be a crisis over a small issue, they can understand the wisdom of compromise rather than escalation.